Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for, thank you very much for each and every one of you here today for being with us. Uh, we are very pleased to be able to conduct such meeting, uh, gathering people from different countries to discuss one of the hot topics in therapeutics, which is infectious diseases. Before we get started uh, with our journey today, which is going to be a very fruitful journey, inshallah, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all of you for attending this webinar, let's say, or, or conference. And my sincere appreciation also goes to our distinguished speakers and, of course, to the ECPP Excellence in Clinical Pharmacy practice team, which is always working hard to fulfill the mission of achieving excellence in clinical pharmacy. In today's gathering, inshallah, we are going to focus on infectious, disease, on infectious diseases. Why have we chosen this topic? I think all of you might might know the reason um, because we all know that as a clinical pharmacist, the bacteria, the, there is an there is a massive irrational antibiotic use, antimicrobials, you, irrational antimicrobial use worldwide and especially in the developing countries which is contributing to the bacterial resistance which is on the other hand on the rise um, so i think we as a clinical pharmacist we have got a major role in at least uh, compacting or decreasing or limiting this problem inshallah as i have mentioned we have got diverse topics Okay, these diverse topics will be presented by top speakers uh, from, with different specialities from different topics, from different countries. The first speaker to be is Dr. Abrar Thabit. Dr. Abrar is an assistant professor of infectious diseases in the Faculty of Pharmacy, King Abdul Aziz uh, University in Jeddah. Um, Victoria Abrar, the, the floor is yours, or let's say the screen is yours. So go ahead and share your screen, and we are very excited to hear you. You can just unmute yourself and then you can share your screen. Okay, so Dr. Abrar is saying to me, just give me one second. So Dr. Abrar is going to be with us shortly, inshallah. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Um, I hope everyone uh, can hear me well. If you can just let me know uh, from, the, from the chat screen, if you can. Everyone can hear me. Okay. All right, it seems like uh, many people can hear me very well. All right. 
Uh, so, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, first, I would like to thank, uh, to thank the uh, excellence and clinical pharmacy practice group for this kind of invitation. Uh, it's actually a pleasure to uh, uh, be a speaker today. Um, and of course, you know, this is not my first online webinar that I present, but uh, it's definitely the first online webinar that I present here in the Arab world um, and um, to such good audience. Um, so today's topic, uh, I think it's not catered to those who are still students, um, maybe interns and beyond, uh, anyone who already, who has already graduated from pharmacy school, um, and is already practicing pharmacy, uh, might be able to understand because we have some sort of, uh, uh detailed information in terms of antimicrobial resistance and, uh, gram-negative bacteria. Um, so... There is antimicrobial resistance in gram-positive bacteria, as you may all know. We have uh, methicillin-resistant uh, Staph aureus, um, and you know, and we have also resistance in Streptococcus pneumonia. We have resistance uh, with Enterococcus uh, bacteria, uh, but uh, these are you know less. Um, uh, they are less virulent, um, even though they are prevalent worldwide, but they are less virulent and we have uh, many alternative treatment options for them. Uh, but the gram-negative bacteria and the resistance in, in them is actually what uh, uh, considered as a global problem and everyone is concerned about it. So that's why our focus will be on the resistance uh, in that group of bacteria, the gram-negative bacteria. So first of all, um, I'm just going to give you a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about today. At first, I'm going to talk about the background and significance of this resistance. Um, and then I'm going to uh, break down the resistance associated with negative bacteria uh, into extended spectrum beta lactamase, AMC beta lactamase, carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and then finally, Acinetobacter bomani. Um, and then at the very end, I have one slide talking about the approaches to optimize clinical outcomes of resistant infections. So let's start with the background and significance. So at first, uh, you know, I usually, you know, if this is a live presentation in front of, you know, physical audience, I would ask them what's the difference between antibiotic resistance and antimicrobial resistance. Uh, but, you know, I'm just going to present the answers. Antibiotic resistance is basically uh, a resistance in bacteria. So a change in bacterial response antibiotic due to genetic changes. How does this differ from antimicrobial resistance? Well, antimicrobial resistance encompasses antibiotic resistance, but it's also a broader term. So it includes resistance by any other uh, pathogens and other microbes, including fungi, viruses, and parasites. So in a resistance call it like by fungi and like against antifungals, uh, we can't call it antibiotic resistance, but we can call it antimicrobial resistance. But in a resistance by a bacteria, we can call it either antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance, and you can find both in the literature. Now, why antimicrobial resistance is super important globally? Well, as you can see here from this figure, is that, you know, right now, so the blue, uh, the blue color represents the current situation. So the current situation is that we have about 8.2 million deaths due to cancer. Um, and, you know, and, you know, the same, you know, and then we have a diabetes, 1.5 million and so forth. And then with the road traffic accidents, we have 1.2 million. Right now, with antimicrobial resistance, we have about 700,000 uh, deaths are occurring due to antimicrobial resistance. However, by year 2050, it's estimated that the rate of death due to antimicrobial resistance may reach up to 10 million uh, which can, which would exceed the death caused by cancer and even road traffic accidents and so forth. Um, in terms of rate, the death toll could be, you know, can reach up to one person every three seconds if antimicrobial resistance is not tackled now. That's how this you know, this issue is, is quite challenging uh, globally. Uh, and these data are actually derived, as you can see here from the reference below, is from um, a UK developed uh, document that was just recently published a couple of years ago. Also, uh, 
a lot of uh, uh, literature, a lot of uh, research studies published in the literature uh, found that there are like poor clinical outcomes associated with such resistance, uh, such as increased mortality, as we saw in the figure, uh, increased mor morbidity as patients become more sick and develop complications when they don't heal from the infections, um, also increased hospitalization time and length of stay, which ultimately would re lead to uh, increased uh, cost. Um, so in terms of poor economic outcomes, uh, there would be increased antibiotic expenditure when we try to uh, administer different types of uh, antibiotics just in a way uh, striving to uh, cure the infection that is resistant uh, to treatment. Uh, also increased hospital costs, as we said, it's it associated with increased uh, length of stay. So that definitely means that there will be increased uh, uh, hospital costs and like cost of uh, admission, renting a room, uh, the nursing time and all these uh, costs. Of course, uh, patients, when they get admitted, they can't go to work. So that's definitely uh, another disadvantage. Uh, so the last slide about significance is, uh, as you may have heard, uh, in September 2016, uh, the United Nations and the World Health Organization, which is part of the United Nations, they conducted a high-level meeting on antimicrobial resistance. They handled it as if they are handling uh, a real physical war. Uh, but this is a war against microbes, against an enemy that we can't even see by our uh, naked eyes. Um, and many countries uh, that are members of the World Health Organization, actually, uh, they signed uh, an initiative to uh, tackle these problems. So the presentation I'm going uh, to show today is pretty much derived from a review article um, that I authored on antimicrobial uh, resistance. And I would like to invite all of you uh, to uh, find it online uh, where we actually talked about the, gram, uh, the resistance in gram positive bacteria and then we went to gram negative bacteria. All right, so first we're gonna start with the, uh, we're gonna, start talking about the resistance to shit with gram-negative uh, bacteria. So as you can see here, uh, the mother is telling uh, her daughter uh, or her son to eat the antibiotics in order to become a big, strong bacteria. What this cartoon tells us is that, you know, misusing antibiotics is definitely uh, help growing uh, superbugs or, or what we call like, you know, strong bacteria that become resistant to treatment. So uh, in terms of gram-negative uh, resistance, we're going to first start by talking about extended spectrum beta-lactamases, or what uh, they're known as ESBO. But before we talk about that, we have to uh, first you know, start with some basics. So when we say beta-lactamase, just the term beta-lactamase means that these are a group of enzymes that hydrolyze beta-lactam antibiotics. And so they would result in abolishing their effect. So their, the beta-lactams will no longer be able to work. Now, we have different types of beta-lactamases. The first beta-lactamases uh, that were uh, found or discovered uh, were encoded by genes called TIM1, TIM2, and CHEV1 uh, genes. You don't have to know the genes, but just know that there is uh, a group of beta-lactamases that is known as broad-spectrum beta-lactamases. And this type of uh, enzyme actually destroys uh, the basic beta-lactams, and these include penicillins and narrow-spectrum cephalosporins. And by these, we mean the first and second generations of cephalosporins. So again, we have the first group is called broad-spectrum beta-lactamases. And these destroy the early beta-lactams. And as you can see here from uh, this table, and this one is derived from a paper by Dr. Jacoby uh, right here that is published in New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so the broad spectrum uh, beta-lactamases, uh, luckily they are, can be inhibited by clavulanic acid and other uh, beta-lactamase uh, inhibitors like dazobactam um, and uh, um, sulbactam. So, if we don't use a beta-lactamase inhibitor in combination, like if we don't want to use ampicillin sulbactam or amoxicillin clavulanic acid or piperacillin dazobactam, if we want to just use a single uh, agent, 
In that case, we could use extended spectrum cephalosporins, and these are the later generations, the third and the fourth uh, generations, as uh, these agents remain active against uh, organisms producing uh, broad spectrum beta lactamases. So, um, Again, uh, if, so the earlier generation cephalosporins and penicillins are inhibited by broad spectrum uh, beta lactamases, but these enzymes do not inhibit the uh, third and fourth generations. Now, uh, other genes encode, encode for a new group of beta lactamases, and this group of beta lactamases destroy the extended spectrum cephalosporins, and therefore they are called extended spectrum beta lactamases. So extended spectrum beta lactamases, or collectively known as ESBL, these destroy the uh, early beta lactams, the penicillins, the first and second generation cephalosporins, as well as extended spectrum cephalosporins, the third and the fourth generations, as well as astreonam. So pretty much they destroy all penicillins and all cephalosporins. Uh, however, in some instances, cefepime can remain, uh, which is a fourth generation cephalosporin, uh, can remain active uh, against uh, some ESBL producing bacteria. So um, as you can see here from the uh, screen, that extended spectrum beta lactamases uh, can inhibit uh, penicillins, uh, cephal all cephalosporins, uh, yet they can also be inhibited by uh, clavulanic uh, acid. So amoxicillin clavulanic acid uh, can still be used, however, in only certain situations, for example, uh, in case of urinary tract infections. So ASBL, uh, which kind of bacteria that produce ASBL? Uh, ASBL is pretty much produced by Enterobacteriaceae, which is a family of bacteria that include uh, E. coli, Escherichia coli, Klebsiella pneumonia, Enterobacter, Citrobacter, um, uh, Providentia, Serratia, Morganella, um, all these uh, belong to uh, Enterobacteriaceae. And then also produced by uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Acinetobacter boumani. I can see some lines here. I don't know where these came from. Um, okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, so before 2010, uh, CLSI, which is the Clinical Laboratory Standard uh, Institute, uh, which uh, produced uh, the document, uh, the M100 document, which has the uh, MIC uh, breakpoints, the susceptibility uh, breakpoints for bacteria that tells us uh, at certain MIC values whether these bacteria uh, are susceptible, intermediate, or resistant to certain antibiotics. Uh, so this uh, document, or CLSI, uh, at first when the problem of ESBL uh, first occurred, uh, they suggested that the, when an antibiotic is not responding to, uh, or when a, an infection is not responding to a certain antibiotic, to do um, an ESBL testing. Uh, but right now, because of, you know, not all microbiology labs uh, have the facility or the ability to do uh, the ESBL testing, uh, they just made it simpler and they lowered uh, the MIC uh, breakpoints or the susceptibility uh, breakpoints, uh, making more bacteria less susceptible uh, to antibiotics. Uh, so, for example, previously, uh, cefazolin and cefepime, uh, the you know has a susceptibility breakpoint of uh, eight microgram per milliliter or lower, uh, and the MIC for uh, or susceptibility breakpoint for peperacillin tazobactam against enterobacteriaceae was uh, 32 microgram per milliliter um, or lower. Um, however, after in 2010, uh, the M100 document produced by uh, CLSI had lower MIC uh, breakpoint uh, for interior bacteria ACA to uh, less or equal than uh, uh, two micrograms per liter for cefazolin cefepime and a 16 microgram less or equal than 16 micrograms per liter for peperacillin tazobactam to avoid the need for uh, ESBL testing. Um, so the antibiotics that we could use against ESBL producing organisms include, uh, of course, carbapenems. Uh, we can also use high dose cefepime, which is uh, controversial. Uh, and then peperacillin tazobactam, uh, if the MIC is less or equal than 16 microgram per milliliter, but only in UTI, not for other infections. 
Um, also, we could use phosphomycin, uh, digicycline, and nitrofurantoin for UTI only, and colistin. However, it's recommended to uh, reserve it for uh, more complicated infections. Now, speaking about AMC beta lactamases, uh, they're also called uh, uh, and These confer resistance to penicillins, cefamycins, uh, third generation cephalosporins, and variably to uh, astrinum. Uh, the, uh, it's, they're resistant to even uh, beta lactamase inhibitors like flavulanic acid, sulbactam, and tazobactam. Uh, they're mainly produced by a group of bacteria collectively known as uh, space, Serratia maricens, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Sinitobacter bumani, Citrobacter friandii, and Enterobacter cloacae, as well as some other members of the Enterobacteriaceae family. Uh, the antibiotics against MC beta lactamase, uh, we could use cefepime, uh, definitely carbapenems, uh, tegacycline in some case uh, reports, as well as uh, phosphomycin. Okay, I was told that I only have two minutes. Um, I still have a um, couple of more slides. Can I, I don't know if I can get uh, five more minutes. Okay. All right, now we'll talk about uh, carbapenem resistant Terobacteriaceae. So, um, as we saw that uh, ESBL and MC beta lactamase producing uh, organisms can only be treated by uh, carbapenems since uh, cephalosporins and other penicillins uh, cannot be used against them. Uh, so unfortunately, this resulted in, in a, like a large increase in the use of carbapenems, uh, which led to the emergence of uh, carbapenem resistance. So how carbapenem resistance occur? Uh, in fact, there are more than one mechanism uh, by which bacteria uh, causes like results uh, or uh, harbors resistance against carbapenems. Uh, so the first mechanism is decreased permeability by, by modifying membrane porins so that uh, the antibiotic can no longer uh, enter the uh, cell, the bacterial cell, or the production of carbapenemase enzymes, which most of you might have heard about. So what type of enzymes that are produced by Enterobacteriaceae? There are actually three different classes. Uh, the first one and the most common one is called Clebsiella pneumonia carbapenemase, or KPC. Then we have amber class B, which is methylobetalactamase, uh, and it includes uh, emipidemase, virone emipidemase, and uh, New Delhi methylobetalactamase, which we're gonna uh, discuss in a little bit more details. And then we have class D of zacylidases, and these are pretty difficult and very challenging uh, to be treated by, which are called OXA48 and OXA181. So again, uh, CLSI, the document, the, the uh, agency that produces the MIC susceptibility breakpoints, uh, and instead, instead of testing for carbapenemase, they just lowered the MIC breakpoints uh, for um, uh, enterobacteriaceae for carbapenems against enterobacteriaceae uh, from uh, four, less or equal than four micrograms per milliliter to less or equal than uh, uh, one microgram per milliliter. So we're going to start about a uh, talk about KPC first, which is the most frequent enzyme that uh, you might you may encounter in your clinical practice. Um, mainly produced by Klebsiella pneumonia, and hence the name. Uh, and it also can be produced by E. coli, Pseudomonas, as well as Acinetobacter. Uh, the antibiotics that can be used against KPC producing organisms, and of course, it's not going to be uh, a carbapenem by itself, uh, but definitely colistin, which is a very old antibiotic, but that is uh, currently being used against uh, uh, CRE or carbapenem uh, resistant uh, Derbacteriaceae. Uh, tegacycline can also be used, but please be in mind that we can't use tegacycline uh, for bacteremia or urinary tract infection. Um, and also with regards to tegacycline, uh, the recommendations in new studies is to use the higher dose of tegacycline. So a loading dose of 200 and a maintenance dose of 100 BID. Uh, the standard dose in the prescribing information is 100 as a loading and um, a 50 uh, milligram BID. Uh, as a maintenance dose, uh, but to treat resistant infections, it's better to use uh, double the dose. So 200 loading and 100 BID uh, maintenance. Also phosphomycin uh, could be used. However, unfortunately we don't have it available intravenously, but it's available in Europe. Um, and then of course, aminoglycosides if susceptible. Uh, double carbapenem regimen have been used, uh, has been used in some uh, case reports and, and some small studies. 
And uh, we also have the new agents, Siftazidim Avibactam, and Avibactam is a carbapenemase uh, inhibitor. Uh, we also have Mirapenem Vaberbactam. And it's highly recommended to use a combination therapy of at least two or three agents over monotherapy against these resistant infections. Now we're going to talk about New Delhi Metallodialectamase, and it was first discovered uh, in 2008 or 2000, 2009. So it was first identified in 2008 uh, in a 59 year old Swedish patient of Indian origin who was in a visit uh, to New Delhi and acquired a urinary tract infection there. Uh, that was carbapenem uh, resistant. So New Delhi, and that's why it was called New Delhi metallobutylactamase. So it belongs to class uh, B, uh, beta-lactamases, and it hydrolyzes pretty much all the beta-lactams except the monobactam astrinam. So it hydrolyzes penicillins, cephalosporins, uh, and carbapenems. And, you know, as this might represent a good news, however, 80% uh, of the bacteria that produce NDM uh, also co-produce ESBL and AMCV lactamases, which results in a resistance to astreunam. So still astreunam uh, cannot be freely used against NDM-producing bacteria. So uh, which bacteria that produce NDM? These include Enterobacteriaceae, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Acinetobacter vomani. Uh, the antibiotics that we can use against NDM1 include uh, colistin, figocycline, and again, the combinations, ceftazidim avibactam or meropenem vaberbactam, and estrinam only if it shows a susceptibility in the MIC report. Now we're gonna quickly talk about uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is known to be associated with healthcare-associated infections, and it's inherently resistant to many antibiotic uh, classes and can easily develop a resistance upon antibiotic exposure. Uh, just a very important definition is uh, MDR. MDR, or multidrug resistance, uh, means that the bacteria is resistant to three or more drugs from different antimicrobial classes. Uh, the main resistance mechanism by which Pseudomonas aeruginosa uh, resists antibiotic treatment is either decreased permeability, uh, target modification, active efflux or kicking out the antibiotic out of the cell, or production of hydrolyzing enzymes. Uh, the antibiotics that we could use against MDR Pseudomonas is any antibiotic that uh, looks susceptible in the MIC report. Um, also, ceftilazine tazobactam, which is a brand new uh, antibiotic or cephalosporin that was uh, approved in December 2014. Ceftazidine <laughs> avibactam, meropenem vaberbactam, as well as colistin. And uh, the good thing is that even uh, resistance to the monosterginosa can be treated uh, using monotherapy if the antibiotic is susceptible, is, uh, if the bacteria is susceptible to that specific agent. Now, lastly, we will talk about Acinetobacter, which is also associated with hospital infections. Uh, and MDR has spread worldwide, and it quickly and easily develops resistance upon antibiotic exposure uh, and develops as a resistance mechanism similar to those produced by Pseudomonas. Uh, the MDR Acinetobacter has the same definition as MDR Pseudomonas, which is resistance to three or more drugs from different classes. And then we also have extensive drug resistance acinetobacter, which is resistant to at least one agent in all antimicrobial classes except two. And then we have the worst kind, which is the pan drug resistant, which is resistant to all antibiotics in all classes. And then resistance to colistin, uh, colistin of course, makes the treatment extremely uh, difficult by you know, not having options to treat this bacteria. So the antibiotics that we could use against resistant uh, acinetobacter, and of course, according to the MIC report, uh, colistin, uh, for the most part, remains active against acinetobacter, uh, and again, any antibiotic that shows susceptibility in the MIC report in combination with uh, colistin, such as carbapenems, aminoglycoside, pegocycline, uh, in high dose, or rifampin. Ceftazidim so avibactam can also be used in meropenem uh, vaberbactam. Uh, and acinetobacter, unlike acidomonas, should be treated using a combination therapy. Now, some approaches to optimize clinical outcomes uh, in uh, antimicrobial resistant infections is to time uh, the antimicrobial therapy as soon as possible and avoid any delays. Uh, and identify patients who are at risk for antimicrobial resistant infections, which is we have uh, in, in the review article that I mentioned, we have a table two that uh, lists the risk factors. 
And of course, once you have the MIC report, to so please de-escalate from broad spectrum antibiotics to a narrower therapy and optimize the dosing strategies based on pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamics of antimicrobials, like extending effusions for beta lactams, using the heart rate nomogram for aminoglycosides once daily dosing, uh, trough monitoring for vancomycin, uh, antimicrobial steroid chip using the hospital system, uh, like an antibiogram uh, to monitor the resistance, uh, formula restriction of certain antibiotics, uh, and staff education of stewardship strategies and uh, prudent use of new antibiotics to avoid emergence of persistence. Uh, with that, I conclude my presentation and I appreciate your listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Abrar, for this informative and interesting talk. Um, it was really, really very informative. Um, as we all know that our session name is um, Irrational Antibiotic Use and Managing Bacterial Resistance. So now we have, we have talked about how about managing about managing um, bacterial resistance and now let's talk about the irrational antibiotic use so inshallah we will leave the questions at uh, the questions and answers by the end of the session and now we would like to welcome our distinguished speaker dr mansoor adam dr mansoor adam holds a phd in pharmacy practice and pharmacoepidemiology and he is currently working in a college of pharmacy taiba university in medina tfaddal dr mansoor the screen is yours Dr. Mansour? Yes, come on. Dr. Mansour is here. <clears throat> okay, Assalamu alaikum. Hello, can you hear me? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, can you hear me? That's my quick turn yes. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abrar, for the very informative uh, presentation uh, about bacteria resistant, and it was really helpful and very, uh, very, very useful for all of us. Uh, as we all know, bacteria resistant is, uh, is really, uh, uh, nowadays, is, uh, is very common, so uh, and one of the reasons could be that uh, antibiotic is freely dispensed in community pharmacy, uh, especially in our developing countries. So uh, uh, that's why today I'm going to speak about uh, a study that we have done uh, about like two years ago. Uh, and the study was done in, in, in Riyadh uh, among uh, community uh, pharmacies. Uh, so the title of the presentation or the title of the study is uh, Reasons uh, Behind Antibiotic Dispensing Without Prescription, uh, Community Pharmacist Perspectives. Okay. Uh, this study was authored by me and my co-authors uh, are uh, uh, Professor Hisham al uh, He is uh, the CEO of Saudi Food and Drug Authority. Uh, uh, previously, we, we were working together in KSU uh, uh, at the time that where we, the study was done. And our, our another co-author is uh, Muhammad al He's a uh, student and now he's doing his PharmD, uh, almost completed in the USA. And we, uh, we also had a collaborator from UK, from the Center of Population Health uh, science uh, uh, from the University of Edinburgh uh, Medical School, uh, who is uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Aziz uh, Sheikh. 
So uh, the outlines of my presentations today is going to be as follows. First, I'm going to talk about background, and then we will talk about who uh, or WHO responses to misuse of antibiotics. And then we're going to, to talk a little bit about uh, the consequences of irrational use of antibiotics. And then we will come to justify why our study is important. And following that, we're going to talk about uh, uh, our study objectives and then about methodology and uh, the results that uh, uh, we, uh, we, we got. And then we will talk about the conclusion and uh, recommendations. Okay. Uh, so as, as it has been already documented in so many studies and by the international organizations, that in many places, antibiotics are overused and often given without professional oversight. And this is also uh, the case in, when we talk about Saudi Arabia or when we talk about uh, our developing countries, we can always go to the shop, to the, the pharmacy shop, and we can always buy antibiotics. So because of that, the WHO, the World Health Organization, started uh, so many initiatives long times ago, okay? And one of those initiatives, we're going to just talk about just two initiatives, uh, one, of which, one of which is the World Antibiotics Awareness Week. The World Antibiotic Awareness Week uh, has been uh, there for uh, almost uh, about three or four years now. And it's a campaign uh, uh, that uh, raises awareness about antibiotic use uh, with the theme that antibiotics handle with care. So in this team, in this uh, campaign, antibiotic awareness is for the healthcare professionals, for the patients, and for the public. So it's a week that is uh, celebrated or that, or that is uh, uh, has been, uh, 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 you know, followed by uh, different uh, countries, especially the World Health Organization uh, 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 countries. And the second, uh, the second response or the second activity is the Global Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance System. It's a WHO-supported system to support a standardized approach to the collection analysis and sharing of data related to antimicrobial resistance at a global level to, to inform decision making, drive local and national and reg, uh, regional action. So uh, in, in, this, in this initiative, the WHO encourage uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance studies and encourage us to collect data about antibiotic resistance and this data can be shared between different countries so that we can see the trend of antimicro antimicrobial resistance, uh, maybe uh, worldwide. Okay, and the consequences of irrational use of antibiotics, of course, uh, patients with infections caused by drug resistant bacteria are at increased risk. And this has been already covered in the previous presentation, uh, this, the consequences of antibiotic resistance which is worse outcomes, and it may also, if not managed very well, it can go up to death of the patient. And also the consumption of more healthcare resources. Of course, when patient is admitted to the hospitals because of antibiotic resistance, the, the, the cost of treatment and the cost of uh, hospital stay and the cost of uh, illness and the cost that the patient uh, will be out of job for some time, he will be uh, in, 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 in home for some time, and, and at the same time, the patient will be uh, uh, suffering from financial uh, problems. So antibiotic resistance and irrational use of antibiotics has uh, negative, out, negative health outcomes as well as uh, negative uh, uh, financial uh, uh, outcomes. Okay. So now when we come to talk about the situation uh, here in Saudi Arabia, 
and why our study is so important. We, uh, uh, during our, uh, our literature search, we found that there was a study that conducted on 2011, and the study was published in, two, in, in uh, BMC Public Health, and this study was a simulation study. It was a cross-sectional cross simulation study, uh, uh, and, and this study was conducted among community pharmacists. So the study finding was that 77.6% of community pharmacy dispense antibiotic without prescriptions. And when we look in our real life, daily life, we can also say that antibiotic is dispensed uh, regularly and without any uh, restrictions. So, but when, when it comes to research, we need to have uh, evidence that, that is documented and that is published so we can build our uh, finding on that. So we thought about because this is the situation. So, and everybody knows that antibiotic dispensing should be regulated and should be uh, restricted to only prescription. So we thought that let's do a study and find out why the community pharmacists dispense antibiotic without a prescription. So there was our study objectives was to explore the views and experiences and uh, perceptions of community pharmacists about antibiotic dispensing without prescription. So our question is why, okay? So when it comes to why, okay, when we want to find why, we uh, do a study uh, types which is called qualitative studies. So qualitative studies is an exploratory studies which, is, which will find the why of, of our issue under study. Okay, so there was our, de our design, our study design was a qualitative inquiry, uh, which was conducted among community pharmacists working in Riyadh city. Okay, and our setting was, of course, uh, Riyadh. Uh, and in qualitative studies, usually what we do is we conduct uh, interviews, interviews regular, like like uh, like a TV interviews or like a newspaper interviews. You go in and you interview people and you listen what people think. You let people talk. You let them talk and say whatever they want. You just give them a hint and just give them a small question and then uh, build your questions on their perception, on whatever they say. So it's like interacting with your interviews, okay? So that's why we conducted, because we want to find why. That's why we conducted interviews. So interviews were conducted with the pharmacist using a semi-structured in interview. Semi-structured interview, that means it's not structured. It's not like uh, you have a paper, you have the questions and you ask, and uh, you ask question one, what's your name? My name is blah, 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 and then you go to the next question, no. Uh, semi-structured interview means that you have a question, it's like an interview, you ask the, your, uh, your, your study subject, and based on their answer, you, 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 you develop a prompt uh, answers, okay? A prompt uh, questions. So this is what we did, and then uh, this data, was, okay, so usually qualitative data has to be audio recorded. So when you talk and when you talk to the pharmacist, you, before talking to the pharmacist, we need to have uh, their consent and we need to explain to them the study objectives and we need to take their permission that the study, uh, the, uh, the interview will be recorded, okay? And we need to also uh, take a consent from them that saying that this Data will be published, or this data will be uh, will be uh, presented in the conferences. So, uh, in this, uh, when we say this, we have to make sure that the confidentiality of the information is maintained. So, how do we uh, how do we maintain the confidentiality? Is by 
uh, not mentioning the uh, pharmacist uh, uh, names, uh, not mentioning the pharmacist pharmacy name, okay, and uh, not mentioning uh, any uh, personal information about the about our study subject. So this is what we did. We did interviews. The interviews were audio recorded. Then after we recorded the, the interview, then the interview were transcribed verbatim. Verbatim means by word by word. I mean, we don't change anything. We just put what the uh, study subject say. Even so, if it's wrong or even so it doesn't make sense, this is not our job. Our job is to reflect or our job is to tell our audience that this is what the community pharmacist thinking, uh, this is why community pharmacists are dispensing antibiotics without prescription. So the, the, the data was already recorded first, second, the data were uh, transcribed, and then it was coded. Coded means uh, when we have a transcript, uh, the transcript we will have like, uh, if the audio tape was like, for example, for one hour, then the transcript will be like several pages, about 10, not, not 10, actually more than 10, about more than 50 pages. So when you have more than 50 pages, because you interview different uh, people, so in our case, we interviewed, actually we approached 20 community pharmacists. Out of these 20 community pharmacists, only 16 uh, responded and, and agreed to participate in our study. So imagine you have 16 interviews, and how many pages we will have that uh, that is uh, transcribed. So this data, transcribed data, will be coded. So coding will be based on the common themes, okay? The common themes or the common factors, or you have to find out uh, what, uh, I mean, it's like, it's like putting, putting it into headlines and summing and, and you know, collecting information and putting it into different uh, categories, okay? This is what we mean about uh, coding. So we had 16 interviews, okay? And as we mentioned that the confidentiality and anonymity were maintained through the study and all community pharmacists were informed that no data that could lead to identification of any participant will uh, be uh, published in any in, in, in any form. <clears throat> okay, so after uh, after coding the data and transcribing and, and audio taping, then uh, when we come to the result, we had uh, we had uh, as we said, we we approached twenty two community pharmacists. Okay, and out of this twenty two community pharmacists, only sixteen community pharmacists were interviewed. Okay. Uh, of course, all the pharmacies that were interviewed were male, okay, and actually none, uh, uh, all of them were non-Saudi national and the majority, uh, about 11, were uh, uh, having uh, five years or more of working experience. So uh, more than about 70% of the people that we interviewed, they have uh, actually a good uh, 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 time of, of, of experience, about more than five years, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, enough to, to, to have, to really have, uh, uh, to, to, to see their perspective and to see their experiences. And what do they think about uh, uh, antibiotic dispense? Okay, so after analysis of the data, uh, we, uh, we, we, we found out that there are some factors which is perceived by the pharmacist to be contributing to antibiotic dispensing without prescription, okay? Uh, and these factors were categorized into different categories, okay? Uh, the first factor was the requesting of medication by name. So most of the pharmacists, they said that if, okay, if, the patient come to me and he requested antibiotic by name. I want this antibiotic. That means uh, that they will they will dispense the antibiotic. So this is the coding that we talk about. This is one of the codes which is very common 
and it was said by a community pharmacist number 10. So what he said, he said that I will dispense antibiotics without prescriptions to patients if they requested the drug by name. Why? Because this means they have used it before and they are familiar with the use. So when we really think about this and we see the real life, I think it makes sense because uh, if you talk to the community pharmacist, they would say, yeah, I know this guy, he always come and a request for this medication. They would immediately just give him the medication without really thinking about bacteria resistant or thinking about, uh, uh, or even thinking about the regulation, I mean, regulation which is already in place, which is, uh, which is already there for a long, long time. But nobody is listening and nobody is caring. And even if you go to any community pharmacist, you will see the sign and you will see the uh, big board like this. And, and well, what they wrote there is, Antibiotic could not be uh, could not be prescribed without prescription. You have to have a prescription to get an antibiotic. So, but this is this really happens to me. And I went to the pharmacist and I asked the community pharmacist. I told him, "Can you sell me an antibiotic?" He said, "Yes." Then I asked him. I told him, "So, what about this board? What is written there? It's not. It is not uh, allowed to." To sell, to sell me antibiotics without prescription. So his answer was, he said, this is just for the Ministry of Health. Don't worry, whatever you want, I'm going to give it to you. So this is a bit funny, but it's the practice, okay? Uh, so the second factor was uncertainty about physician diagnosis. Uncertainty about physician diagnosis. So what was the code? The code was, this is the community pharmacist number nine. If I feel an antibiotic is indicated, so according to his own uh, diagnosis, for the particular patient, I will immediately dispense it because even physicians do not perform all the necessary laboratory tests and sometimes they prescribe antibiotics without doing any laboratory test. So he, this is an argument and he's saying that even if you go to the, to the physician, he will just give you antibiotics without doing any test, so why don't I just give it to you, okay? All right, so uh, the factor number three was unavailability of clinics after office hours and in case of emergency. And the code was, sometimes patients come to me early in the morning at 3 a.m. There are no clinics at that time. So what do you want me to do? I'm just going to dispense antibiotic the patient because they need it, okay? And the second part was, if a patient requested antibiotics in emergency case and he doesn't want to visit the physician, I will dispense antibiotics for him, all right? So the factors number four was business issues, business. Whether we like it or not, this is what they really said, okay? Sometimes I will dispense antibiotics to avoid losing my customers. Because simply, they said that if I don't prescribe, if I don't dispense, he's going to go to the next pharmacy and he will get it from that pharmacy. And, 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 and I will lose him. So next time he will not come to me, he will go to the other pharmacy. Okay? And another uh, quote was, you should keep one thing in your mind. Give patient what they need, not what you want them to buy. The most important factor in business success is trust building, trust building. So this is how our community pharmacists really uh, think, okay? And the factor number six was promotions and bonuses from pharmaceutical companies. So pharmaceutical companies give us bonus if we sell more antibiotics, but we dispense antibiotics only when needed. So it seems that the pharmacists are really confident and they really uh, confident that they know antibiotic is indicated and we, we are giving it to the right person and we are giving the right antibiotic. So why everybody is worried about uh, antibiotic dispensing without description? This is what our pharmacists are, are telling us, okay? So our conclusion was 
pharmacists showed an alarming irresponsible practice that encourages misuse of antibiotics by the public. Misuse of antibiotics uh, uh, by, by the public, okay? And also several factors encourage pharmacists to dispense antibiotics without prescriptions. We have seen those factors. Some of them are business. Some of, of them are, uh, are the perceptions that the community pharmacist has that they can dispense antibiotics uh, uh, same as the doctor, because even doctors are not doing any tests, they're just, just, they are just prescribing, okay? Uh, our third conclusion was, it has been several decades since the Saudi Ministry of Health has prohibited over-the-counter sale of antibiotics. However, these rules and regulations are often neglected by community pharmacists, the patients and even the pharmacy the pharmacy owners, as we said that when we talk about promotion and pharmaceutical companies, okay? So our recommendation was that combination of public education, professional training for pharmacists, physicians, uh, nurses, and everybody involved in patient care, and enforcing regulations are likely to be important in ensuring more appropriate community, community dispensing and use of antibiotics. And these recommendations have been uh, tested uh, in many places and it has been uh, really doing uh, very well. Okay. Now after our recommendation and conclusions, because as I, as I mentioned, this study was conducted like two years ago, okay? But now, uh, like two or three weeks ago, or about a month ago, the Minister of Health, okay, uh, the Minister of Health had a new rule, okay, a new rule, which is, uh, which uh, clearly mentions that if you sell antibiotics without prescription, you will be in jail for up to six months and your license will be, uh, you know, you will be taken out from you and it will be uh, you know, uh, expired, okay, and you will have uh, to pay up to 100,000 uh, real of fines, okay. So my question is, do you think this will have a positive impact? Do you think this advertisement of this new rule will really have a new impact? So if I do this study again after implementing this uh, new rules. Will I have a different result? I really want to find out. And then, how about reasons mentioned by pharmacists in this study that may sound uh, logic, at least for the community uh, pharmacists? Uh, I think these questions maybe we can discuss, uh, uh, maybe we can discuss during the questions and answers. And if there is anybody from the attendees which is, who is from uh, regulatory, uh, agencies like FDA or Ministry of Health, maybe they can give us if there is any uh, update on that. Uh, thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for your listening. And uh, 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 this is how I conclude. Uh, this is how I conclude. Okay. Thank, thank you so you much. And thank you for sharing such an interesting um, study. Um, I really liked the the way you explained the how the qualitative studies is conducted and the coding and these kind of things because most of the time what we find is like descriptive quantitative studies but qualitative studies are more or less let's say here in Sudan is not that common um, um, now the floor is like we have got like five minutes we want to uh, have some questions either you can write on the chat section and I will read it loud or you can unmute your um, your audio and then you can ask um, uh, our speakers, Dr. Abrar or Dr. Mansour. So is there is any question for Dr. Abrar or Dr. Mansour?
Any comments? Okay, I've got a question to Dr. Mansour. Um, you have mentioned that um, you have approached firstly 22 community pharmacies and then the number which have agreed to come up with you on this study is 16. So, so, so when you ask the patient, when they, when you ask the community pharmacist, you ask them, and they knew that you are conducting the study, right? Yes. They, they, yes. they know, they know that you are conducting the study, and this study objective is blah blah blah, and so on. Exactly. And, yes. And they, have, and they have been that honest with you. Uh, yeah, actually, because we. We guarantee to them that the confidentiality of the data will be maintained and no names, no pharmacy names. Uh, and, uh, and this is uh, just for maybe changing the regulations or recommendation to the you know, regulatory authorities. And you don't have to worry about any budget talking to you. So that's why they were really honest and they were really, actually you feel that they, they really want this is change, but mm. but at the same time they said, okay, if I change myself, if I change my my community pharmacy environment and how I deal with antibiotics, how about the the pharmacy that is next to me? If mm. they don't change, then I don't have to change because I'm going to lose exactly. my exactly exactly. If, um, if yes. I don't sell it, another another pharmacy might sell it. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so another another comment about the regulations which has been mm -hmm. just uh, been adopted in Saudi Arabia regarding the antibiotics. I, I find that quite fascinating. Fascinating to me because um, I think the practice will totally change if there is such penalty and fine uh, to be to be to be given to the pharmacist. I think. In my opinion, I think this the practice will change, and I think it will be very interesting to do this as a baseline study and then conduct another study after several months from this rule and regulation yeah. and to know what has yeah. happened, right? I really, I really want to do that, and I, I really welcome any any collaborator from our audience if they are really uh, interested to at least. Uh, join me in my next study to find out whether this new rules has changed the practice, has changed the how community pharmacists think, or how how their perspective has changed uh, or not. And I I really also wanted if there is anyone from our audience who is uh, practicing in Western countries, UK, US, or any other uh, Western countries. Uh, to, 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 to just talk to us about their experience about antibiotic dispensing because um, I, I, what, what, what I hear from people uh, is that uh, you can never buy antibiotics without prescription. So I would really love if anybody can. Okay, if you allow me, Dr. Mansour, um, um, I haven't practiced in, in, in UK, but I have, con I have done my master in UCL in University College London, and part of my, part of the master degree was uh, like uh, spending nine months shadowing clinical pharmacists, and I was shadowing the clinical pharmacists in Charing Cross Hospital which is the NHS, one of the NHS big hospitals. So what I have noticed from that is um, antibiotics are never ever being, being given to anyone without prescription. Okay, however, what they do there, the, I mean, not the British, but the other nationalities, what they do when they go to their home countries, they come with their own antibiotics you know for example they they go for example to, to Sudan to come here to Sudan to go to, go to um, UAE and so on and they bring their own antibiotics with them okay but um, the pharmacists there they have they never ever give antibiotic without prescription and this prescription it has to be validated either valid validated by the general practitioner the GP 
or any other consultants or any other hospital. So this is what I have noticed from the, the nine months or the six, seven months I have, I have stayed in the hospital there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. So I have got yeah. a question here uh, from Dr. Tariq. He is asking Dr. Abrar, um, uh, and he is saying to you, is there any study conducted here in Saudi Arabia measuring the prevalence of antibiotics resistance? Dr. Abrar, is she here? Yes, she is. Yes, um, I'm right here. Um, in, in terms of the prevalence of resistance, um, I did actually um, a literature review about this. And uh, uh, we do have very, very few studies. We don't have a nationwide antimicrobial surveillance uh, study, unfortunately, like the ones that are conducted in the US or um, at the level of Europe. Um, however, we do have some smaller studies here and there. Um, uh, most of them are either single-centered uh, or um, focus on specific uh, bacterial species, like for example, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, or as we know, it's as uh, MRSA, or um, AMC beta lactamase producing bacteria, or uh, carbapenemase produ producing bacteria. Uh, we don't have a nationwide uh, study that, you know, uh, focuses on all resistance collectively, or um, you know, a nationwide study that even focuses on a single bacterial species or a single um, you know resistance mechanism. All the studies that we have in the literature so far um, are mostly single-centered. So, uh, meaning that they included bacterial isolates collected from a single hospital. Um, maybe a couple that I saw that include you know, ISO was collected from two or three hospitals, but nothing, you know, pretty big uh, at the level of the country. So I hope this answers the question. Okay, thank you. So I've got here one comment um, uh, from Victoria Iman. She's saying the new regulations might prevent pharmacists from giving antibiotics, but why there is no regulations to doctors regarding antibiotics prescription? Okay, so I think here Dr. Iman is uh, raising a point of, um, if I understood you well, um, why doctors are prescribing antibiotics without confirming the presence of infection by laboratory measures, if I understand you right. Um, I think that's, that's another, another, another area which can, which can be also area of debit. Anyone like to comment, Dr. Iman, about this? No, I think I think I think for the doctors, um, doctors who are in the hospitals, who are in the who are in the clinics, um, I think it's worthwhile to, to confirm the presence of infections by doing the CBC, the C-reactive protein, and such things. I don't know what 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 is the the practice in Saudi Arabia, but here in Sudan, I mean the the we are far the community the community itself and the pharmacists themselves are far contributing to the irrational use of antibiotics more than the doctors. Uh, I don't know what is the situation in Saudi. Um, anyway, in order not to run out of time, our next the session, inshallah, is going to be about immunization. Again, I would like to thank to thank you, Dr. Abrar and Dr. Mansour, for 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 um, for this nice nice um, nice presentations. Uh, the 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 question which has just been raised, we will answer it inshallah later after we finish. Um, our next session is going to be about immunization. And in this session, we have got two presentations, one of which is going to be unfortunately recorded, which is the, the, the presentation to be presented by Dr. Sheza Humeda. Unfortunately, due to her work, because she is a registrar, she is a pediatrician, registrar pediatrician, due to her work circumstances, she couldn't make it with us today. But thanks to her that she recorded the, the latest 
uh, immunization guidelines in the UK with regard to the pediatric population. What I would like the audience to do is, if anyone is hearing me through the PC, I would like them to hear me through a set set phone or um, uh, and the salt might be a little bit or the voice might be a little bit low okay so what I'm going to do now um, I'm going to open the video which has been recorded by Dr. Shaza Umeda Yeah, the Torah, this is why I say to you, uh, put your headphones on. Sorry, there is a, just a technical fault, just a minute. It is worth mentioning that the filters of what we I find this track to be interesting given that the UK has some Thank 
Um, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people um, are just like mentioning that it's not clear enough. Um, so uh, um, let's go for a quick vote for people who thinks that they can continue for this another 12 minutes. Uh, if they want to continue, press one. If you don't want to continue and you would like to go to the to the next session and you would like this to be uploaded later, uh, press two. So two, okay. Um, so for the all people, please vote. Okay, I think mostly most of us are going with the with delaying it or uploading it in the in in the YouTube channel. Okay, so. So, okay, so um, that's a bit of unluck not to have the Kurosheza with us and at the same time, I think what she was uh, mentioning about the immunization in the UK, me myself, I was very excited about it, but I will, I will, um, I will, I will just listen to it um, and I will upload it for you all in the YouTube channel. So now our next speaker is Victoria Shayma Saad. Victoria Shayma is a teacher assistant at the Department of Clinical Pharmacy, Cairo University. She's going to present to us something about the immunization, the general recommendation for use, and the misconceptions about the immunization. Victoria Shayma, the floor is yours. Are you ready? Are you ready? 
I will stop the share from here and you can share your screen. So, yes, so okay, my is starting. Okay, I want to check the sound. Is it okay? Yes, the sound is okay. Okay. All of you can, yeah. can you hear the Torah Shema well? Okay. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, firstly I want to thank you for ACCB to give me that chance and opportunity uh, to present uh, this uh, nice presentation about immunization. Uh, before we talk about the general use recommendation and use misconception, I want to remind you about the different types of uh, vaccines. Let's start with the different types of vaccine quickly. Uh, there are diff four different types of vaccines. Firstly, there is a live attenuated vaccine that's uh, modified, weakened live virus uh, that produce immune response similar to the natural infection. Uh, it's apparently that the first dose of live attenuated vaccine is enough for most people. However, there is some people may need additional dose, except for the oral, uh, oral polio vaccines that may require three doses. Uh, it's important to note that the adverse effect may be similar to the vaccinated disease itself, but it's not severe uh, in most people. Uh, and so important also to uh, note that the uh, live attenuated vaccine is contraindicated in the immunosuppressed patient because it can cause uncontrolled replication shortly. Uh, let uh, us talk about the uh, examples uh, about live attenuated vaccines. It's so important to know them uh, for the rules we will take it after. Uh, when we apply the rule for live attenuated vaccine and when it shouldn't be applied. So it's so important to know uh, who are the live attenuated vaccines? There are seven types of virus vaccine and only one type of bacterial vaccine that's live attenuated. So let's talk about the examples of live attenuated vaccines virus, uh, that's MMR, varicella, zoster, yellow fever, rotavirus, intranasal influenza, the intranasal only version of the influenza, and the oral polio. And for the uh, bacterial vaccine, there is only order typoid. That's live attenuated bacteria. Let's talk about the second type of vaccine that's inactivated. And uh, it's uh, important to know that's inactivated by uh, several means like heat or uh, chemicals or both. So it's not live vaccine and therefore cannot replicate in the body. Uh, unfortunately, maybe in activity vaccine may require several doses. Let's talk about the uh, first dose uh, only frames the immune system, only induce and prompt the immune system for the immunity and subsequent doses produce the immune response itself. Uh, so it's important also to know who are the inactivated vaccines? There are several types and several examples of inactivated vaccines like the polio, hepatitis A, rabies, hepatitis B, influenza, cellular pertussis, the human papilloma virus, anthrax, diphtheria, and pertussis. Uh, the third type of uh, vaccines are, is called polysaccharide vaccine. What is the polysaccharide vaccine? Polysaccharide vaccine is an activated vaccine that contains long chain of sugar molecules that make up the surface capsule protein of bacteria. So the protein capsule of bacteria, we take 
the long chain sugar molecule, that's the vaccine. And there are two types of polysaccharide vaccine. The first type is the pure polysaccharide vaccine, pure, pure version of the polysaccharide vaccine. And it's uh, unfortunately and not suited for children that are younger, younger than two years of uh, old. Uh, not because of uh, uh, side effects that may cause in them, but uh, because uh, children doesn't have uh, the T cellular, uh, the P cellular immunity. P, uh, yani we have to remind and have to go back for the immunity. There are two types of immunity, T cell mediated and T cell mediated. T cell mediated for cell immunity and T cell mediated is for humoral immunity. So children younger than two years doesn't uh, don't have this type of T cell immunity uh, that's not well developed in them. So they not produce uh, immunity against uh, the pure polysaccharide vaccine. So it's uh, suited only for adult patients or children that's older than two years of old because uh, it doesn't require T helper cell but require T cell that's developed in adults and children. Uh, uh, above uh, two years and it's not uh, developed in uh, children younger than two years. Uh, examples of pure polysaccharide vaccine is pneumococcal, meningococcal, and salmonella 5. So what about how to, re how to uh, modify them to suit children uh, younger than two years? Fortunately, they developed a type of vaccine that's called conjugated vaccine. Conjugated vaccine that's this is a pure polysaccharide vaccine. We uh, change the, the structure of it. We add uh, somewhat a protein carrier uh, that can induce the T cell uh, other than the P cell immunity. So if it's induced a T cell that's developed already in the uh, young children, so it can cause immunity. It's uh, uh, passed over all uh, overview about the, how uh, they develop the conjugated polysaccharide. So the conjugated polysaccharide, the polysaccharide vaccine that has an added protein, which it changes to a T cell mediated response. So it will be suited for children that are younger than two years. And these types of polysaccharide vaccine, like uh, conjugated polysaccharide vaccine, like Haemophilus influenza type B, e, pneumococcal, and meningococcal vaccine. So it's important if the patient is a child and is younger than two years, we would give uh, them uh, the conjugated type of polysaccharide for those vaccines. The last type of vaccines is uh, called a recombinant vaccine. And recombinant vaccine is produced by inserting part of the gene of the antigen into a gene of another cell like yes cell and the new cell then grows inside and then harvested and purified. Uh, those uh, types of recombined uh, vaccine available like human papilloma virus, hepatitis B, live typhoid vaccine, and salmonella type. This is uh, this picture shows how uh, they develop uh, how uh, the different uh, stages of the uh, developing of the uh, recombined vaccine. So let's talk about now about the general recommendation. We uh, talked already about the different types of vaccines, so we can uh, clearly understand how this recommendation can be applied. Uh, first recommendation about the timing and spacing. If the patient has received one of type of vaccines, what about the other type if it, uh, it's uh, requested to be taken? So timing and spacing antibody vaccine interactions. Uh, and when we talk about antibody, antibody equal to the immunoglobulin or the serum, okay? So if the patient, because if there is a, a antibody and the vaccine at the same time in the serum or the blood of the patient, that will be, that may cause interaction between them. So the patient received the vaccine, vaccine, um, uh, I mean uh, by vaccine, the two types of the live attenuated or inactivated uh, vaccine. So let's talk uh, vaccine here is a live attenuated vaccine. If the patient received live attenuated vaccine, we have to wait two weeks before administering the antibody 
uh, that's uh, equal to the immunoglobulin. So if you receive live attenuated vaccine, we have to take, you have to wait two weeks before administering the immunoglobulin. And if we receive the immunoglobulin, so wait three months before administering the vaccine. Otherwise, the, uh, that will cause interactions between them. So uh, it's this rule is not applied. It's so important to know that this rule is not applied towards the inactivated vaccine. So it's important. The first, three, we remind you about. Uh, I remind you about the uh, different types of uh, activated or inactiv inactivated or uh, live attenuated vaccines. Uh, for example, let, uh, let me give you an example of this. Uh, if uh, uh, a nurse is hurt with a needle and uh, contaminated with the hepatitis B virus, so we uh, have mentioned before that the hepatitis B virus is inactivated vaccine. So it, uh, it, it's uh, okay for her to take the post the vaccine and antibody at the same time. That's no problem for this rule about the inactivated vaccine. Only the problem here if the vaccine is alive attenuated. Let's talk now about the simultaneous administration. So important uh, for you as a pharmacist to know that uh, there is no limit to the numbers of vaccines that can be given in the, the same session, the same visit. If a patient came and uh, need to take several vaccines at the same session, there is no limit about the number of them in the same session. But uh, if unfortunately one of them is stabbed and cannot be given in the uh, same session, uh, especially if the vaccine is a live attenuated vaccine, if the vaccine missed in the session is a live attenuated vaccine, cannot be given before four weeks. We have to wait for one month uh, to give it later. Uh, but this rule also is not applied for inactivated vaccine. It's peace for inactivated uh, vaccine to be given at the, any time. Let's talk about age requirements. It's so important uh, for this rule also to, uh, to take you in your consideration that vaccines should, shouldn't be given earlier than the minimum age requirement for the vaccine. For example, measles vaccine is given at 12 months at uh, at the first year of uh, the children, at, 12 at the age of 12 months, if the uh, measles outbreak have happened uh, in an area and the MMR vaccine given as an outbreak, okay, that's not count toward the third. So we will repeat if, if the child have taken it before the uh, age of 12 months, okay, as an outbreak, as an outbreak the vaccine. So it will, we will repeat it at the age of 12 months again. So it's important to note that the vaccine should be given exactly at the time uh, mentioned in its timetable, in its vaccine timetable. Maybe later, but not, it's not allowed to be given earlier, okay? Now, let's talk about the number of doses. We have mentioned it before, that the live attenuated vaccine will produce an immune response after one dose, and the second dose is recommended to ensure 100% of immunity, okay? It will need uh, one, only one dose to induce the immunity sufficient for the patients, and in some patients may require a second dose. But for the inactivated vaccine, we require two or three doses for the immune response to be completed. Okay, and for example, if, uh, in case of Tdap, okay, vaccine, they require booster dose every 10 years, every 10 years before, because immune response may win over time. Now, let's talk about the different types of adverse reactions. Uh, in some patients, the uh, vaccine uh, may cause uh, several types of uh, adverse reactions. It may cause only local injection, may cause systemic uh, reactions, uh, or may cause uh, allergic life threatening uh, reactions. Uh, we have to differentiate other pharmacists between them uh, carefully uh, to know that, uh, we, uh, what, what should we do for that. Uh, so the vaccine may cause local uh, injection site reactions only like pain, only redness, swelling at the site of uh, injection, and that uh, may occur within four hours of injection. 
and that's common for the inactivated vaccines. Uh, in some patients and in some uh, types of vaccines, the vaccine may cause systemic generalized non-specific symptoms like fever, rash, headache, uh, malaise, myalgias, and loss of appetite. And uh, this type of adverse reaction are, is more common with live attenuated vaccine. Typically occurs uh, within seven to 21 days uh, of the uh, bion's uh, injection. And the last type of adverse reaction is called allergic and that's life threatening. Unfortunately, it means it's medical assistance immediately and maybe because the vaccine itself or uh, maybe uh, because of one of the components of the vaccine, like eggs, neomycin, latex, if it's a combined vaccine. Uh, but fortunately, its rate is so rare uh, worldwide and it's about one in five, uh, each uh, five, so, uh, 500,000. Uh, so, uh, where we should re uh, report any adverse reaction uh, after the vaccine injection, we should uh, report, actually we should report any adverse reaction after the vaccine to the uh, vaccine adverse event reporting system. It's called the BARS, and it's, it's a subunit of centers of disease control and prevention. It's a subunit of CDC. So we should report any clinical, uh, clinically significant adverse events. Uh, what about contraindication? When we should permanently contraindicate the vaccine for the patient and uh, when uh, it's a temporary contraindication, okay? Uh, about the permanent contraindication if, the, if, if there is a, a severe allergic reaction after a previous dose. If the patient has received a dose of the vaccine and this vaccine causes a severe allergic reaction like uh, encephalopathy uh, after pertussis vaccine uh, that occurred typically after seven days of the injection. So this patient will permanently uh, deprive of this vaccine. Okay, if the, uh, if the child has received pertussis vaccine and developed encephalopathy within seven days, we will remove the pertussis vaccine from its uh, vaccines, okay? Uh, what about temporary contraindication to live attenuated vaccine? Uh, there are uh, two uh, cases we should contraindicate temporarily the, the live attenuated vaccine. The first case is a pregnancy. Pregnant uh, woman shouldn't be administered live attenuated vaccine because it theoretically um, may cause a chance of infection to a pass through the fetus. Okay, uh, but the inactivated vaccine it's okay for pregnant to, to uh, receive it because it's uh, cannot replicate. Uh, uh, it cannot replicate and doesn't cause danger. Uh, for or hazard for the pregnant woman, except for the human papilloma virus, because its safety hasn't been studied well. So uh, the pregnant woman shouldn't receive the human papilloma virus uh, until she uh, delivers the baby and then can receive it. Okay. Um, and pregnant women are at increased risk of complication from influenza. Therefore, they should be given the inactivated influenza vaccine. Not the intranasal, so we have mentioned before that the influenza vaccine, the only uh, version of influenza vaccine that's live attenuated is the intranasal. But it's okay for the pregnant woman to receive any in inactivated influenza vaccine. Uh, let's talk about the second case for uh, the temporary contraindication to live attenuated vaccine. It's immunosuppressant, immunosuppressant uh, patients. So uh, if the patient is immunosuppressant, shouldn't be given, shouldn't receive like attenuated vaccine because of the possibility of uncontrolled replication and inactivated vaccine may be given, may be given here as a pregnant woman. However, here their immune response may be diminished because the immune, uh, uh, in, in case of immunosuppressant patient, uh, the immune response and uh, the immunity of them uh, may be not well developed, so it may not it doesn't cause it may not cause uh, a well developed immunity for them. So, uh, what is the definition for immunosuppressant patient? Who who is the patient uh, 
uh, that I will call him immunosuppressant and I will not give him any live attenuated vaccine. If the patient receives long term, so every word here means uh, is meaningful, okay? Long term, the first one, long term. Second, high dose, third, oral steroid are contraindicated with live attenuated vaccine. So long term means here, uh, greater than 14 days of high dose means uh, 20 milligram per day and for oral steroids uh, prednisolone or other one or uh, or greater than two milligram per kilogram per day if the patient receive uh, uh, these uh, steroids we will not give him any uh, live attenuated vaccine so if the patient receives aerolyzed, aerosolized or topical steroids or short-term steroid person only, they are not contraindicated to live attenuated vaccine and they are given okay for him. Uh, and live attenuated vaccine also can be given three months after cessation of chemotherapy. If the patient receives chemotherapy, we have to wait for three months before uh, before uh, they can be received uh, a live attenuated vaccine. Uh, household context of contraindicated population may be given live attenuated vaccines. So it's one of the misconceptions in, uh, in uh, with some patients or with some populations that the household context of uh, the contraindicated immunosuppressant patients shouldn't be given live attenuated vaccine, but the uh, correct information that they are, can be given live attenuated vaccine. Uh, here, let's talk uh, uh, quickly uh, about the invalid contraindication. There are some misconceptions about the contraindication um, for the vaccine. Uh, first one is mild illness. Uh, second one, antimicrobial therapy. Some uh, some people uh, think that if the patient receive antibiotic or antimicrobial therapy, they shouldn't receive their vaccine in time. No, uh, they can receive it. Okay. Uh, third, the misconception is that disease exposure. If the, if the patient exposed to disease itself, should uh, give uh, should be given the vaccine or no? They can be. They should be given the vaccine. Uh, otherwise, the doctor say something another than that. Uh, household contact. We have mentioned it in the previous slide that household contact uh, with pregnant or immunosuppressed person can be given the vaccine. Uh, breastfeeding uh, can be given the vaccine. Preterm birth can be given the vaccine. Also, a family history of adverse event. Uh, if your cousin is. Um, uh, develop any side effects of one vaccine. Uh, there is misconception in some patients or some uh, people that uh, uh, if my cousin, my aunt, if, uh, if, if, if there is any family history of adverse event, I shouldn't receive the vaccine. That's uh, a misconception of that. Uh, multiple similar tennis vaccine, we have mentioned that there is no limit of vaccine that can be given in one session. Otherwise, one of the missed vaccines is life attenuated. We should wait for one month before we receive it. Uh, current administration of tuberculin uh, scan test. Uh, there is only uh, one note here in this test. In case of measles containing vaccine, it can affect the sensitivity of tuberculin uh, scan test. So the measles containing vaccine cannot be administered on the same day as tuberculin testing. So the test should be postponed at least uh, four weeks after the vaccine. So if we cannot administer the two in the same day, in the same time, we should postpone the test after four weeks or one month after the vaccine. So now we come to the end of the uh, this uh, past presentation. Thank you all for uh, for your listening. Thank you for ECC. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shayma. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so if you just stop your sharing the screen, I'll share my screen from here. So um, now by this, we have, we have finished the session of the immunization. Um, I do apologize about the inconvenience in the, in the video, which is, uh, 
which was supposed to be presented by the Torah Shaza Hameda. Now I have got another bad news. <laughs> Unlucky, it is um, that Dr. Karim is because we have we have gone beyond the scheduled timing, and he is committed elsewhere. He won't be able to present with us. However, um, we will go immediately to the session. The session was about an antimicrobial stewardship. Dr. Karim was supposed to be talking about what is antimicrobial stewardship and the role of the pharmacist. And me, myself, who, who is the last speaker, I'm going to be introducing myself. Um, my name is Sahar Mamoun. I am a board certified pharmacotherapy specialist. I have got a master in clinical pharmacy from University College London and I have got master in business administration where I specialize in total quality management. Um, I am also an internet, I have got a license of an international certified trainer from Oxford. And today, inshallah, I am going to be presenting my project, which was done in 2013 while I was an, an MSc student. And this, uh, this, is, uh, this project was about an antimicrobial, about an antibiotic stewardship or the formulation and, implement, and implementation of anti antibiotic treatment guidelines. Okay, so as I say to you, this is was a project, complete project. And before I start, I was expecting Dr. Karim to be there, at least to, to give you uh, a definition about an antimicrobial stewardship. But in general speaking, antimicrobial stewardship is a set of coordinated strategies, which is, which is its primary aim is to improve the use of the antimicrobial. So what I have done here in the in this project, which was International Perspective in Health, the project was called International Perspective in Health, and the aim of the project was to, to be able to develop a complete service, okay, and this service to take it home and to implement it in your home country, okay. So as we go on, you will find it that it is a coherent coherent complete object going we will go through the financial the financial the financial background we will go through the marketing how am i going to mar to market my product and so on so the project about formulation and implementation of antibiotic treatment guideline which is only one part of antimicrobial stewardship what are the other parts of antimicrobial stewardship antimicrobial stewardship in addition to the guideline, it involved the infection control, it involved the education and the main part of the program. As I say, what is the aim of the antimicrobial stewardship is to improve the use of the antimicrobial. Okay, so um, um, I will just give you some, but this is, this is as if I am talking to a British audience or what I have done uh, in during my MSCC, I gave them like a background information about my home country and then the market analysis. What is the health status? Why this service is needed? Why antibiotic treatment guideline is needed? And then I will define my proposed pharmacy service. I will go through the financial projections. I will, I will go through thoroughly through the marketing, marketing plan and the quality assurance and finally the conclusion. Background information, I know all of you know Sudan, Khartoum is the capital city of North Sudan and the population is approximately 2 million. I'm talking about as when I was saying it in 2013. The GDP per capita in Sudan is uh, $2,300 and the health care expenditure in 2010 was 6% of the GDP, okay, the market analysis and the health status, okay, so in order for me to convince them about my service, I have to talk, tell them about what is the health status is like in my home country, why, how is this service is going to, it will serve the community, it will serve the population, okay, so um, the uh, the the 
The life expectancy um, in males in Sudan is 58, females 61. Okay, what are the leading causes of deaths in adults, malaria and tropical diseases, in children, the GI and the respiratory problems as per the WHO? Okay, why have I chosen this, uh, this service? As I say, due to the irrational antibiotic use in Khartoum, I have tried to rely on relevant studies, okay, although it was a bit old study, but a study was conducted by the WHO in 1993, and it found that the, uh, when using standard drug use indicators, it revealed that 63% of the total prescription in 20 healthcare facilities use an antibiotic irrationally. Wow, I was talking all this and there is no share. <laughs> I'm sorry about this. I'm very sorry about this. Um, did you hear me while I was talking or Did you hear what I was, was saying or no? Yes, but there was no sharing. Okay. 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 So, um, as I said that we, um, I have tried at that time to rely on irrelevant, relevant studies and the study conducted by the WHO in 1993 uh, revealed that 63% of the total prescriptions um, in 20 healthcare facilities are used inappropriately and uh, another study highlighted the overuse of antibiotic in pediatric hospitals which is recorded the antibiotic prescriptions to be 81.3. The resistance, the impact of the above mentioned was the increase in the resistance to commonly used antibiotic as well as broad spectrum antibiotic. Okay, so the pharmacist intervention in antibiotic use, that is the introduction of the antimicrobial stewardship program. As I mentioned, it's a multidisciplinary approach in which the pharmacist who have who should have an uh, infectious disease training plays an integral role. The recommendations made by the antimicrobial management team consisting of pharmacists was found to be more appropriate choice of antimicrobial. That is, if we, if we implement such intervention, what is going to be the consequences? It's going to be a more, more appropriate choice of antimicrobials, higher infection cure rate, lower total hospital cost, and um, consequently, if, I'm, if I say more appropriate choice of antimicrobial, it means decreasing of the, uh, the, the uh, managing the bacterial resistance. So um, my study area was a, a hospital in Sudan, and this is a secondary level care hospital. It consists of six wards and two five one beds. It's equipped with microbiological microbiology laboratory, which is an integral part of the antimicrobial stewardship because the treatment guidelines, if if developed from the scratch, it should be developed according to the microbiology, as we all know. The hospital have got several committees, drug and therapeutic committee and infection control committee, and also a recent formulation, formulation of drug formulary at that time was done. Okay, so why do we need and the treatment, the antibiotic treatment guideline in ACTH, the hospital, infection constituted 15% of the total admissions in 2001. The hospital expenditure on drugs in 2000 and 2011 was 1440, and the share of the antimicrobials was 20%, which is pretty high. So the hospital future plan is to formulate antibiotic guidelines to, as to promote the proper use of antimicrobial and hence reducing these costs. Okay, so the aim of my project was to rationalize antibiotic consumption. As I said, I won't be able to rationalize antibiotic consumption by just putting the treatment guidelines, okay? Um, it, it, the, the antimicrobial stewardship and antibiotic stewardship program cons, con, Constitute, uh, it, 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 um, it, it constitute from several parts, it has got several parts. The objective was to be able to help the doctors to select the most appropriate agents, empirical treatment, with the, with the proper dosing, route, and duration, to minimize the use of the broad spectrum 
antibiotic to reduce the cost, whether it's the expenditure on antibiotics, whether it's the hospitalization cost, or whether it's the cost associated with the treatment of the resistant infection. Phase for the development of an implementation of the guideline, phase one was the formulation of an evidence-based guidelines. The, the first step was doing an audit of the current practice, which was a retrospective study to identify the causes of irrationality, as I have as mentioned by Dr. Mansour earlier, but since it was a retrospective study, it wasn't like a qualitative type of study. So this is carried out by clinical pharmacists and then the surveillance system. What is the surveillance system? The surveillance system was, is, was like a baseline information. During six months, I was trying to know what antibiotics are being used in this hospital, what is the sensitivity and the susceptibility of the pathogens, which is this is completely laboratory based. This is why um, a, a group of people have to work on this. And here I have got the microbiologist as an integral part. Why? Because from if we if we if we try to, uh, for example, uh, apply the guidelines of the UK antibiotic guidelines here in Sudan, I won't be able. I won't be able to say that it's going to be completely wrong, but as we all know that the antibiotic depends on the sensitivity and the susceptibility. So for me, in order to be able to choose the antibiotic wisely, I have to know what is the pattern of the, uh, what is the pattern of the, uh, of the bacteria there. Okay, and then the development of the guideline itself, multidisciplinary approach, antibiotic hospital team function, I have to involve the treating physicians, uh, okay? It's as a matter of commitment, as a matter of in, in, um, in order to make sure that in the future they will take this, this, these guidelines on board, okay? The guidelines, I was only focusing on the antibacterial and the pharmacists should have an infectious disease training. Phase two was uh, publishing and implementation. And um, having said all of this, here I'm not talking about a project of two or three months. I'm talking about a project which can last between six months up to one year, okay? So it's not an easy because if I'm doing a surveillance for six months only, you can imagine how long will it take to, to, do, to do the other, the other phases. The phase two was the publishing and the implementation has to be approved by and agreed with the physician within the hospital and the approval from the Khartoum State Ministry of Health and then the distribution of, of the pocket booklet to all prescribers and pharmacists and then to do an educational intervention. Educational intervention is an integral part of, of this and if I have I don't do training uh, it all of all of my work would be worth, worthless. And when I came here in Sudan and I have done this, um, I found that the booklet can be just like, you know, you can find it everywhere, but no one is using it. If you are, you are not reinforcing it by training and training and training. Okay, the daily workflow of the service. I have to have a, an infectious disease clinical pharmacist um reports will come the, uh, the report culture results from the microbiology will come the clinical pharmacists have to review the appropriateness of the empirical therapy and this is after developing the guidelines and then create list of inappropriate therapies review an appropriateness of a high cost agents okay and approve dispensing of recommended treatment from the pharmacy this is, has to be done collaboratively with the infectious disease physician which is which is not commonly found, but let's say the physicians or the prescribing physician. Together, the clinical pharmacist with the physician will change the inappropriate therapy and document the changes, de-escalate to narrow options if possible, change from the IV to oral, because when we are talking about the irrational use of antibiotics, we are not only talking about the choice of the agent, we are also talking about the route of administration and then monitor for antibiotic side effects, which is mainly the, uh, the, the, the responsibility of the clinical pharmacist. The financial projection, I won't be going through this, but um, 
I have to have to estimate like startup cost, okay, for this, and fixed cost per annum for, for, for my service. And then I have to also include my cost for, from the pharmacist salary, okay? And then what am I gaining from the project or from the intervention, which is expressed as cost avoidance, okay? The total patient of the first year, this was all done based on assumptions, okay? Uh, patient treated with the guidelines, cost avoided from, uh, from saving one day uh, or one day uh, stay in the hospital, okay? So uh, I was supposed to, 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 to calculate the break-even. The break-even point is the point um, at which uh, when I say that my project has break, has broken even, it means that uh, uh, the break even after two years of implementation, it means that after two years, I will be making profit out from this project. Uh, I will be making more profit, okay? So I will have the return on, on my investment. It will be finished and then I will be making more profit or I will be saving more and more. Uh, I will be saving more and more. Okay, so in order, as I say to you, we had to have the project holistically. We had to, to know who is involved in, the, in this project. We had a stakeholder, we call them stakeholder. And we had to analyze these stakeholders. Stakeholders in terms of who is going to be involved in this. Okay, I have people who are, are highly influenced, have high influence, and people who have high importance. Okay, people who have high influence and at the same time have a high importance, these people they have to manage, be managed closely. I have to follow up with them closely. I have to. I have to convince them from the start. I have to keep reminding them about my service and, and so on. So who are they? Doctors, mainly prescribers. Uh, they should be managed closely. The director of Khartoum, the, the, the state, the state uh, minister, ministry of health, the hospital management, and the infectious disease clinical pharmacists. Who are the people who have got no influence, but they are important? I have to keep them satisfied. Drug and Therapeutic Committee, the Antibiotic Hospital Team, the Microbiology Department, and other clinical pharmacists. Who are people who have influence, but they are low, info, low importance? They have to, to, just to, I have to inform them, they are the patient and relative. Why they have influence? They have influence on pro my project, because they have to follow what is written, written for them. Okay, they don't. They they don't. The, I um. I have to manage them. I have to keep them informed about my service in order to make sure that they won't go to the community pharmacy, bring another antibiotic, and give it to their patients. Okay, so this is our another group of patients, and then I have got people who have low influence and low importance. This is I have to monitor. This is our, the other healthcare providers, such as nurses and pharmacists. So out of these stakeholders, the most important and those who have to be managed and to be monitored closely are the doctors and the hospital management and the infectious disease clinical pharmacists. We have got in the, uh, in, the, in the market, let's say, in the business point of view, what is called marketing mix. The marketing mix is something we have we have studied in the MBA, and I, I know I'm I'm sure that most of you know it. It is the how are you going to market market your service through the product, the price, the place, and the promotion. The product, what is my product? It's the the introduction of the antibiotic uh, antibiotic guidelines. That is the formulation and implementation of treatment guidelines. Price, the cost of impl if implementation will be funded from the state ministry of health. No extra fees will be charged to the patient. The place is the academic charity teaching hospital. And the future, future plan was to use it as a model. Okay, and Alhamdulillah, it wasn't being used as a model. It was being used by the ministry of health itself. And now we have got our treatment guidelines, okay, by the State Ministry of Health. 
and I was one of the people who were involved in the committee there. The promotion, promotion for such service will be uh, mainly by targeting the behavior, the behavior of the prescribers and the patient's attitude. Promotional plan, I have got, as I said, I have got several stakeholders. I have got the general population of Khartoum, I have got the patient and relative, I have got the health professionals, and I have got the hospital management. Each of each of uh, every uh, each of these will be promoted, or the promotional plan should be tailored to them. For example, for the general population of Khartoum, I can can do a TV ad, ad, adverts, newspaper posters, uh, and radios. Patient and relatives, patient educational leaflets in Arabic. Posters in the wards can also be a, another another alternative. The health professional, of course, I will distribute to them the booklets. I will do continuous educational workshop, and this is what we have done. Every Thursday or every other Thursday, we are doing like small workshops, educational workshops, reminding them about the importance of about the, uh, the importance of this hospital management and the Khartoum State Ministry of Health meetings and periodic reports. We have to keep them informed about the about about the about the outcome of such service. Quality assurance for my project, the structure was to ensure that the laboratory equipment were correct during the pharmacist training. The process was the surveillance of antibiotic use, surveillance of resistance, prescribing audit, and the outcome, I was looking at the clinical outcome as well as economic outcome. Conclusion, antimicrobial abuse and misuse is common in Khartoum. Resistance to strain are, are on rise. There is a need of an antimicrobial or antibiotic management program. The proposed service together with infection control program in the hospital will result in higher infection cure rate, lower total hospital cost incurred from irrational use of antibiotics, reduce or stabilization of the level of antimicrobial resistance and the promotion of the role of the clinical pharmacist. So I was hoping this presentation to be as complementary to Dr. what was Dr. Karim was 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 intending to say, but I hope this just gave you a general general view uh, just like for you to go and dig more about the about the about the about the the topic thank you very much for listening and i think now we have got a five minutes or five minutes for discussion and by this and after the five minutes we will conclude our conference and if we were together all together all together in one place we would have our lunch or we would have our coffee break or or whatsoever so i will open now the floor for discussion Anyone having a, a any question from the previous 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 presentations? Ian is more than welcome to raise it or comment as well. Any comments? No comments. <clears throat> no questions to any of our speakers. Okay, Fadl, Victor. Okay, here I've got a question, I have a question. If we want to restrict the antibiotic use in hospital, Shall we start in the ER department? I saw a case where cholestine given for RTA. Okay, so here there is a question either to Dr. Mansour or Dr. Abrar if they are still there. Uh, he is asking if I want to restrict the antibiotic use in the hospital, shall we start in the ER department or me myself even I can answer. So, but I will leave it for anyone who can who can get involved in the discussion. The question is, from where shall we start if we want to restrict the antibiotic use? With what, with which department? The 
Dr. Mansour, do you have any opinion? I think I think um, if we want to start uh, restricting antibiotics, um, as I said, you have to do an audit. Okay, to do an audit, it means that you have to know where is from which department is the the problem is arising the most, okay? And try to start by that area and then and then and then restrict and then move on to the other department. This is my 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 own comment or my own opinion. But I think to to know to start with the area where they are prescribing antibiotic freely, uh, this is going to be the ideal the ideal department. And then you can use it as a model to it, to to apply it in other departments. Wallahu alam. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone if one anyone wants to wants to comment. Could you just highlight the series of antibiotic use based on their priority, please? Could you just highlight the series? Series of antibiotics used based on their priority, please. Um, what do you mean by by their priority, doctor? I mean, e each hospital, each hospital with will have a priority. Will have a formula. نحن عارفين إنه أي hospital بيكون عندها ال hospital formula اللي بتاعتها. ال hospital formula اللي دي it is being developed from the practice, okay? So if you are having a hospital, tertiary hospitals, you know that, uh, okay, uh, this is depends on, as I say to you, it depends on your, your where, where you are practicing, okay? If you are practicing in a country which have a, a, a government assassin in the guidelines, it is best to use these guidelines. If the, the country, doesn't have it is worse in the stamel or the stamely al guidelines min 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 country to come mushapha or setting bita agarib min al setting bita ag tamam um but the best thing is taban inu ikun indak guidelines or to kun indak um state yani mister nahin inda nahasi they have developed the state Khartoum state uh, treatment antibiotic treatment guideline for uh, answering your question a uh, priority it depends on your practice it depends whether your hospital have got a guidelines already set up or not if the, you don't have if, if the hospital doesn't have a guideline refer to the government guideline if the government doesn't have go to a nearby country if they need if you don't find a nearby country I think that we can take the UK guidelines and nice guidelines well American guidelines. Bordu, this is my own opinion. Like in, this is what I have heard in different conferences. Um, if hospital does not have ID doctor, how can apply stewardship program? This is another another good good question, Mr. Kowal. Um, I haven't seen a lot of infectious disease or, or physicians who have specialized infectious disease. However, in London, in UK, and I have seen this. Uh, but ideally, if you don't have it, then you ha you can either if the hospital management is a يعني 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 متفهمة ممكن تأخد واحد من الفيزيشنز أوكي واحد من الكونسلتن تعمل لهم ترين بتاع infectious disease أوكي. But if if not, if you don't have an infectious disease doctor, you want to step stop applying stewardship program. تمام؟ يعني ما حتوقف ال ال program تقول أنا I'm not going to apply because I don't have an infectious disease doctor. It will you to rather be sending a doctor three months, six three months to any other country or in your own country, give him training, bring him back, he will be happy. Okay. Um, any other comments? You are welcome, Mr. Kawaz. Any other comments? Okay, so any other, um, if I said um, comments, do you have any other comments about the
conference itself. Um, and uh, first of all, I would like to to close off or to to do the closing remark. Um, I would like to thank thank our distinguished speakers. I would like to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for 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 being there and for attending. And um, let me start by thanks, thank, thanking our speakers by name. I don't know if they are there. Dr. Abrar, Dr. Mansour, um, Dr. Shaima, and Dr. Sharbi, myself. Uh, and secondly, um, I would like to also express my sincere thanks and appreciation to the team for successful organization of this small meeting. Also, although it is a small, but I think it was fruitful, it was informative, and inshallah, in our journey in seeking excellence uh, in our profession and world clinical pharmacy, we hope to see you all again, inshallah, in many future events to come. profession um, excellence in clinical pharmacy. And from here, you owe me an apology. I do apologize about the video, لكن I will try to solve this and uploaded to YouTube, as I have mentioned. I do apologize about uh, the absence of Dr. Karim, but this is just out of my hand. Thank you for all, and thank you for your attendance. If there is any comments, um, anything else, um, anyone is more than welcome. <coughs> 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 Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Inshallah, hope to see you all again. Thank you, Dr. Ayman. Thank you, Dr. Nargis. Inshallah, hope to see you all again. Wa inshallah, we have good connections with each other from these different countries. Shukran jazilan wa layla saida.